1 لايف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله uh, so welcome uh, everybody and again uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone and uh, the last 10 days and uh, Laylatul Qadr inshallah Mubarak to everyone uh, this is the fourth webinar for us in, uh, in this month in Ramadan and all it's about the COVID-19 uh, and its relation to all parts of the kidney disease. So this is the second part of, um, of the COVID-19 and uh, kidney transplantations. Um, uh, and inshallah, the, it will be, uh, uh, we'll have after it uh, Ramadan and Eid break, then we gonna start again of our uh, webinars and likely maybe one or two still is related to the COVID-19, then we'll go in general for all renal disease because actually we see um, uh, a lot of our colleagues, they get very interested in the webinars. And as you can see, the attendees in the last uh, two days back, it was above 2000 in Zoom and the same number was also in the live streaming on YouTube. So in total, couples, couples of thousand are attendees in those webinars. So I will not take long time. I will give the mic to uh, our moderator, Dr. Hassan Al-Eid, who is the consultant uh, transplant physician at King Faisal uh, Specialist Hospital uh, in Riyadh. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hassan. Go ahead. All mic uh, is you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. Uh, I'm honored and uh, delighted to uh, present Dr. Marcus Pereira. Uh, Marcus is a medical uh, director, uh, transplantation infectious disease program director at uh, Columbia University Irving uh, Medical Center at uh, New York. And uh, more particular uh, to our presentation, he's uh, uh, an instrumental and a leader in uh, treating and fighting uh, the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 in New York, and particularly to uh, our transplant patient, and he is uh, first a lead author and uh, co-author of uh, several publications that are already uh, uh, in the press. Uh, Marcus, uh, please, the mic is yours. Okay, Th thank you, Dr. Um, Hassan. This is a, it's an honor to speak to all of you and a good evening from here from New York. I, I was asked to talk to, to all of you regarding our initial experience with COVID-19 here in New York City among our transplant recipients and in particular with our kidney transplant recipients. Um, and uh, so without much delay, um, what I would do is um, just a brief overview of coronavirus. I'm sure many of you already know much of this. And then after this, we will talk about what our experience was in terms of our transplant population, which got infected with COVID-19 and outcomes and risk factors in particular with a focus on our kidney transplant recipients, and then have a brief overview of some of the data on therapies, which I imagine will be very relevant to any transplant center out there um, who is trying to prepare for this or in the middle of it. So just a brief overview, as you know, coronavirus is a single-stranded RNA virus that is common in a number of animals, um, as well as uh, in humans, as you know, and there are several common types that are known at this point. Um, there are four common coronavirus, the HKU1, NL63, OC43, and 229E, which are common uh, causes of the, of the common cold, so to speak, and are circulating around the world um, continuously. And then there are three more severe types, the initial SARS uh, from the early 2000s, which is now named SARS-CoV-1, MERS, as you, as you might be more familiar with it, um, and now SARS-CoV-2. So the, a little bit more about SARS-CoV-2, it's actually a relatively small virus and it has four important structural proteins. And the one that we talk most about is the spike protein, which forms the function of both binding to cells as well as fusing with them. And then there are a number of other <laughs> structural proteins that are of importance. And um, as far as some non-structural proteins, there are two proteases, the helicase and RNA polymerase, which come into play when it comes to antiviral targets and, uh, and therapies. And it, you may be very familiar as well with the fact that it uses ACE2 receptors 
for cell entry and its interaction with the spike protein that has regenerated some controversy about ACE inhibitors, for example. I won't be talking about that today. I, I believe that Dr. Hussein the other day mentioned that as well. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I trust that you as nephrologists will know far more than I do about that. So the clinical features about SARS-CoV-2 and what is now termed COVID-19, uh, what we know at least from China and now from a number of reports from Italy and, and the United States, you know, it has a variable incubation period from two to 14 days with a median of five days after exposure and development of symptoms. And those symptoms include a number of, uh, of items, but a fever, fatigue, cough are the most common initial symptoms that were reported um, out from China. And, and we certainly have seen that in the general population here in New York City. Um, curiously, there is also additional symptoms that are non-respiratory, including this change or diminution of smell and taste, um, as well as diarrhea, um, which, which happens actually more frequently than we thought initially. And as you know, there's a number of additional symptoms, but those are less frequent. As far as laboratory abnormalities, it turns out that initially it was quite interesting that lymphopenia and or leukopenia were more, much more common than leukocytosis. Um, and that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, not, not sure what that signified initially, but now we think it's probably related to some of the immune, immune dysregulation that these patients experience. And then other findings would be slightly mild hepatitis, an elevated LDH, elevated ferritin, and a number of other inflammatory markers. And then image-wise, as you know, uh, it, this is characterized by a multilobar viral pneumonia. And these are CAT scans from a number of the patients in China with COVID-19. And you can see several gradations of, of, of findings in the CT uh, from mild uh, uh, um, ground glass opacities to sort of multifocal denser opacities, which still have some ground glass evidence here. So clearly, they are distinct radiographical findings that are different from your typical bacterial pneumonia um, uh, in that population. So the clinical course, as you probably are aware, the vast majority of patients do go through a mild course, so that's 80% of them, uh, um, and they, they're either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic and generally recover on their own without probably even realizing that they had COVID-19, which is a problem in and of itself in terms of, uh, of transmission to others. And we won't talk much about that, but it's certainly a major concern. And then a smaller uh, a portion of these patients do develop moderate to severe and even critical disease, as you can see the numbers there, 14% and 4.7%. And in terms of those two other more severe categories, what, what we have learned is that COVID-19 has this biphasic process where it, it is usually initially mild for the first five to eight days after the infection or presentation, and then characterized by this progressive deterioration, um, usually respiratory in nature with worsening um, shortness of breath, worsening cough, fevers, and then sort of more obvious development of viral pneumonia and then progression to ARDS or severe pneumonia uh, um, if, if left unchecked. In some small portion of these patients, they do develop multi-organ system failure and renal failure is a predominant feature of that as well as mild hep or hepatitis or cardiovascular symptoms as you, I'm sure you've read about. And all of that is, is seems to be characterized or, or underlying this hyperinflammatory syndrome that drives this multi-organ system failure. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. The case fatality rate so far reported from studies both in China as well as Europe and now beginning in, in the United States, particularly from some large reports from the CDC in the US, it basically ranges from one to 7.2%. Um, we believe that it's likely the lower spectrum that is uh, uh, more realistic. And a lot of that is, is to, we're, we're not sure what the denominator is in terms of how many people are actually infected. As you can imagine, that will drive a lot of these calculations. But what we know is among the, the patients who do eventually get hospitalized, those numbers are significantly higher. And a lot of the studies will mention sort of this 10 to 15% mortality. Those are among hospitalized patients, sometimes a little bit higher. And of those who are critically ill, meaning either mechanically ventilated or requiring ICU admission, the numbers can be 
stunningly high, like 49% of patients uh, uh, dying uh, during their episodes of COVID-19. And those poor outcomes have been largely correlated with a number of risk factors or comorbidities, I should say, including older age, several comorbidities like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, CKD for sure, um, and like I said, obesity in particular with a BMI over 30. And uh, this, this hyperinflammatory syndrome, the term cytokine storm has been also mentioned a number of times, and we think that this is the primary driver to ARDS. Um, and, and the reason why this was identified or at least mentioned very early on is that this, was, this has been known with the initial SARS as well as with MERS as being sort of the underlying pathophysiology to respiratory decompensation. And this was largely thought to be an upregulation of certain genes that, that, uh, um, and considerable release of pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, TNF-alpha, IL-12, IL-8, among a number of other cytokines. And um, this, measuring these inflammatory markers did seem to uh, time very well with the decompensation where this, this uh, pro-inflammatory phase was delayed and correlated with the progression of symptoms in a number of these patients. And in China, they had observed this initially with SARS-CoV-2 as well, um, including pathological findings like diffuse alveolar damage, desquamation of pneumocytes, with including pulmonary edema, as well as a, a profound interstitial lymphocytic infiltrate. As you can see here from this early report um, on in the Lancet, the panels A and B were lung tissue, and you can see the profound inflammatory invasion of, uh, of normal tissue by uh, uh, as a response to the infection. These were also heart tissue and, and liver tissue that were also impacted uh, um, by COVID-19. And further speciation of these lymphocytes found sort of a CD8 T cell response as well as a, a T817 paradigm in terms of their response. So um, leaving that sort of general introduction to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, um, what specifically to our transplant patients have, were we initially concerned about as we saw this wave of infections coming our way here in New York City? and how this would impact our transplant patients. As you know, I, I deal a lot mostly with transplant infectious disease and, and my primary mission is to care for our transplant patients here at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And uh, this, these questions were posed to us or at least we posed to our teams very early on. So unknown questions included, what will be the infection rate among our transplant patients? Will they be having more infections or less infections in the general population? Will there be more infectious or less infectious than the general population? You know, so that we know that from the initial SARS outbreak that uh, a couple of the quote unquote super spreaders in Toronto were actual transplant patients who infected a large number of additional individuals. Um, what, what would be the clinical presentation, similar or different than the general population? And we needed to be mindful of that. As we know, transplant patients or immunosuppressed patients in general have muted and uh, atypical clinical signs and symptoms when they present with common infections. And would this be a characteristic of COVID-19 as well? And not only just symptoms, but laboratory abnormalities. Would those CT findings that I just showed you, would they be similar in transplant recipients or not? Would our patients be more or less severe than uh, in terms of their disease process than the general population? And you can imagine that a, 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 a long discussion uh, was sort of occurred in terms of if the primary decompensation is a hyperinflammatory cascade, would an immunosuppressed patient benefit from a, a diminished hyperinflammatory cascade or would they have a, 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 the same amount of decompensation as the other patients? what kind of antiviral therapies would these patients benefit the most? As you know, transplant patients often um, have difficult courses when it comes to viral infections, not only because of decreased efficacy of drugs, but also with development of resistance. And would we see that with COVID-19 or are we going to see that? What is the optimal immunosuppressive management for these patients? Is it to continue the same therapies or reduce one form or another? And I, and I know that Dr. Hussein spoke at length about this yesterday. And what ultimately will be outcomes in terms of mortality, hospitalizations, 
but also long-term consequences like rejection and, and organ failure. And then as we move ahead, or as we're in the middle of a surge of infections, how and when to proceed with transplantation? Um, these were enormously complex questions that we didn't know the answers to any of them earlier in March when we started seeing some of our patients here in New York City. So what actually happened here? So as you know, New York City has been the epicenter, epicenter of COVID-19 in the United States for better or for worse. Um, first cases started reported in early March. At our center here, Columbia Presbyterian in, in Manhattan, we, fought, we saw our first solid organ transplant case on March 13th. And, um, and since then have not looked back. Um, there were certainly, um, as of this last week, we had at least 160 of our own patients here from Columbia Presbyterian who have been found to be COVID-19. We suspect a number more of patients developed it. They, did, they just did, were not diagnosed or, or called us for, uh, 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 to tell us about their symptoms. Kidney transplant recipients were the vast majority of these patients. I do have to tell you that. And, you know, because we are a large kidney transplant center here, I think the numbers uh, uh, held true for that. We peaked somewhere between late March and early April. Uh, you know, the sort of the first weeks of April were particularly brutal for our center and for our providers and our patients. We were averaging about six to seven cases a day that were being admitted. Uh, we can only imagine how many more were being infected in, out in the community. And certainly since then, things have dramatically improved with all the measures in terms of social distancing and uh, the ability to diagnose and treat our patients. Now we're down to one to two cases at that uh, um, per day. Um, it's certainly things are calming down enough that we can start looking ahead of, um, in our next steps. All of this had a profound impact in both in our outpatient and inpatient services. So for any program trying to plan how to deal with this, it's an all of the above type response. And uh, it really requires an integrated approach, both from the outpatient and inpatient teams in trying to, to, to take care of our patients. There was a near total hold on our transplants, both kidneys, as well as liver, heart, and lung transplants. And now we're only now emerging from that hold. And I do have to say, it had a direct impact on our staff as well. Um, staff getting sick um, and, uh, um, and being patients themselves. And um, any program, again, trying to plan for this needs to be aware that we might be taking care of our own as well. And that can present with their particular issues. So our initial experience, as, as was mentioned earlier, was documented in a, in a publication from a few weeks ago on American Journal of Transplantation, and I had the honor of being the, the lead author, but a number of our colleagues, both from Columbia and Cornell Medical Center, our sister uh, uh, institution across Manhattan, which forms New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, they're also a major transplant institution and contributed a number of patients to this initial report uh, from the US epicenter. So this was um, the first 90 patients that were diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 uh, at our institution. And again, it was both centers. And this was done primarily through a nasopharyngeal PCR test for patients presenting with symptoms. And the, the study duration was from early March from that first patient through April 3rd. And uh, that's when the cohort ended for this particular paper and we analyzed them for an additional two weeks for additional follow-up. And for the purposes of this report, we classified our patients in three different categories. And you really would see from the literature, there's a number of different ways to categorize patients with COVID-19. We went with something relatively simple in terms of what actual level of oxygen are they requiring in medical care. So for mild patients, th those were essentially those who were able to stay outpatient with minimal symptoms and no oxygen requirement. Moderate with those patients who required admission to the hospital, but were fine in the general medical floor. That generally entailed either nasal cannula, sometimes non-rebreather masks as well, or high flow masks. And then the severe uh, uh, group, which was really those mechanically ventilated or admitted to the ICU, which for the purpose of our institution were one of the same. There were no patients in the ICU who were not mechanically ventilated. 
um, as well as those who passed away. So the next slides will be very data heavy with a number of, of, uh, of tables and I walk you through them, but those are largely on the paper as well. So here, these are the baseline demographics of the entire cohort, um, including patients who were never admitted. And as you can see, um, most of the patients diagnosed with COVID-19 were relatively older at age 57. Um, and then uh, um, about almost half of them were over 60 years of age. And if you were to break down in terms of the mild to moderate group versus the severe group, you can see that there was a, certainly a predilection for older patients having more severe disease, both in percent times, but as, as well as p-value. So driving home the point, the point home that patients that are of a certain age certainly are at risk for some more severe disease. So that's the majority was also of, of male gender. Um, and again, that has been seen in the general population as well. Um, these are reasons that are largely unknown, but perhaps more dysregulated pro-inflammatory response. Um, and then, you know, New York City being a very diverse uh, um, area in the world, uh, you can see uh, um, uh, sort of a, 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 a very diverse breakdown. We have a very large Hispanic population that we serve here in, in our particular institution. So you can see that a big chunk of these patients were of Hispanic ethnicity. Um, and then um, uh, our organ breakdown, and I'm highlighting here the kidney transplant patients. So as you can see, over half of the cohort or kidney transplant recipients. Whether this signifies that they are greater at risk or not, uh, it's not clear, but certainly we do have a large kidney transplant population that we serve here at Columbia Presbyterian. But you can see that it basically impacted all the organs, um, including dual organs like heart kidney, liver kidney, and kidney pancreas as well. Um, and as far as the breakdown for the kidney transplants, it was quite a, a balance in terms of mild to moderate and severe patients. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the subsequent slides. These were a little bit more detail about these patients. And what I've added here that's a little different from the paper is I, uh, I went back into our data and looked at our kidney transplants in particular to provide you with a little bit more data. Um, most of the patients who presented were actually several years out from transplant. These were not recently transplanted patients. So you can see on a median of seven years, uh, 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 since transplant, that's when they presented. So presumably they were out in the community and that's where the spread occurred. It was not necessarily in the hospital or healthcare associated. Most of our patients have a number of comorbidities, much like any transplant recipient will have. So for kidney transplants in particular, about 70% of them had issues with hypertension, diabetes, as well as CKD, which we've defined as a chronic GFR below 30. Um, and whether it was due to chronic rejection or being seven years out, there was some allograft dysfunction already. Um, so a lot of them already had some CKD. Very few patients were already on dialysis. Some patients did have chronic lung disease, and this was whether it was COPD or asthma or emphysema. Um, a few patients did have, were unfortunately being actively treated for cancer, like prostate cancer or colon cancer. And, um, and some of them did have uh, uh, severe obesity or morbid obesity as well. Um, this was generally very similar to the general other organ transplant population, and there was not necessarily a big difference in terms of mild to moderate versus the severe disease, although I would point out that hypertension did seem to correlate a little bit more with disease severity, as did active cancer, although this was only three patients, as you can see, so not that significant. But hypertension certainly something to keep an eye on for kidney transplant, but other transplant patients as well. Baseline immunosuppression had been a huge topic of discussion because um, there were some, some uh, ideas that mycophenolate could have antiviral effects um, and therefore be somewhat protective of our patients. We didn't really see that. Um, as you can see here, the vast majority of our patients were on some form of calcineurin inhibitor and sacrolimus was the most common form, as well as mycophenolate. About half of our kidney transplants were on corticosteroids. Interestingly, Columbia Presbyterian is a, is a steroid free, uh, uh, has a steroid free protocol after kidney transplantation, but um, perhaps the signal here that corticosteroids at least initially made patients a little bit more vulnerable to more severe symptoms. We'll talk a lot more about steroids later in the conversation. And then there is sort of a smattering of other therapies like azathioprine, bilatacept, and mTOR inhibitors, none of which you can draw any conclusions from 
um, but a diverse population in that regard. Um, in terms of other uh, uh, um, aspects of these patients, so um, in terms of days from onset to the test, you know, we, we had initially an enormous shortage of, 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 of test availability. So some of these patients did wait around for a while before they were tested. But in general, patients did not have symptoms for much long, longer than seven days. So uh, um, they were presenting somewhere halfway through their, their disease process. And remember that biphasic period that we initially talked about, by day seven, you start becoming worried that it's not necessarily a viral process, but rather a, a hyperinflammatory process. And although the numbers are not necessarily very different here, um, we were suspicious that these patients presented much later in their course. Very few patients were nosocomially transmitted. These were patients who had been admitted already and um, for several days and developed symptoms in the middle of their admission and then had a positive PCR test. Not that many, thankfully. But one important aspect of testing with PCR is that we had a number of patients with initial negative nasopharyngeal PCRs who, given the high index of suspicion, whether they were having respiratory symptoms or fevers or even diarrhea, the primary transplant teams thought of retesting them and came back positive. So this is an important caveat, just because you have one initial negative PCR does not mean that your patient does not have COVID-19. It really relies on that clinician being suspicious and retesting them. And as far as presenting symptoms, it largely correlated with the general population. And this in some ways was, was an interesting finding that the majority of patients did experience fevers. They did experience cough, fatigue, and myalgias. What was interesting about them that about a third of these patients did have diarrhea. So, so diarrhea in and of itself might be a a, a symptom concerning for COVID-19, and this is informative to the providers. So then in terms of uh, uh, um, degree of severity, as you can see here, about 72% of our patients did get admitted to the hospital because of severity of symptoms. Um, and um, as, as you would expect, most of the patients with severe disease were, all the patients were in the hospital, and uh, um, about 60% of the patients with mild to moderate disease were admitted. So some observations from this initial presentation, most were male, just like the general population. Most were over 60 years of age, and this was associated with disease severity. Uh, one thing that was not captured in this data, but certainly was observed throughout uh, a number of other reports, that lower socioeconomic status was certainly associated with one, developing COVID-19, but as well as disease severity, severity and mortality. And that's an important aspect as we care for our transplant patients understanding their ability to care for themselves and having the resources to protect themselves. Most patients were several years out from transplant, so this really had a strong signal that this was community spread in New York City and New York State. Um, but the ones who were suspected to have hospital-acquired infection, and I'll tell you later, they developed more severe disease. There's a number of false negative PCRs, as I discussed. There was no discernible pattern in immunosuppression, and I hope that Dr. Hussein yesterday um, talked a little bit more about this. And then as far as our, our kidney transplant population in particular, it, does, it did seem to be equally distributed in terms of disease severity, much like the other organ transplants. A little bit more data for you. This is now from the patients who were hospitalized, so 65 patients. Um, interestingly, in terms of vital signs, I would say that um, even though fever was one of the most common signs, that was subjective fever, when we actually measured it, um, on average, these patients were not febrile at 37.5 and 37.2. And interestingly, the ones with severe disease presented with a lower temperature, um, you know, from infectious disease, we always know that someone presenting with sepsis and hypothermic, that's actually a poor marker um, in terms of outcomes. So whether this was already a poor marker for these patients that they present a hypothermic, it remains to be seen, but certainly a signal here that um, you might want to observe that in your patients. Most patients were slightly tachycardic and this was not different. However, in terms of respiratory status, both from a respiratory rate and hypoxia, as you can imagine, the patients with severe disease were more tachypnic and hypoxic than the patients with moderate disease. And this was significantly different. So someone presenting was slight degree of hypothermia and tachypnea and hypoxia, beware that they may decompensate 
uh, more rapidly or will have a decompensation rather than not. So you wanna keep an eye on those patients who present to your emergency room. In terms of blood counts in the initial presentation, there was no discernible, discernible pattern. Our patients were not leukopenic, as you can see, but uh, many of them were lymphopenic. So you can see here that the lymphocyte count was in general a little bit lower than normal. And uh, we paid particular attention to this neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which you probably have read in the literature. Um, anything uh, in terms of a ratio above three to six is concerning for poorer outcomes when it comes to the sepsis literature. And we did find that the vast majority of our patients did have this ratio that was elevated. And particularly the severe disease was higher than the moderate disease, although not statistically significant. In terms of chemistries, you will be curious that uh, creatinine, serum creatinine levels were elevated for the vast majority of the patients and but did not correlate with disease severity. For our kidney transplant patients, I looked back they certainly have higher rates of, of, uh, of uh, higher creatinine levels at 2.37, but again, it did not correlate necessarily with moderate versus severe disease. They just had, uh, in general, higher degrees of chronic kidney disease. An interesting finding that you might observe in your own patients too is degree of albumin. Um, so although initially for the entire cohort, 3.6 was quite normal in terms of what a normal albumin level is, but when you look at the severe patients, um, they generally had a significantly lower albumin level. And this has been actually uh, 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 found in a number of studies for the general population as well. And, I, and we believe that this just is a, is a surrogate marker for underlying comorbidities and general frailty. So if you have a, a more frail patient who's slightly malnourished with a lower albumin, be careful as well about them. Um, as you can see here, our liver transplant colleagues were very concerned about whether AST and ALT and other liver enzymes would be significantly impacted, and those were not, um, as well as the total bilirubin. Those were not significantly different. As far as inflammatory markers, we were very keen on measuring those because of what's, what had been uh, reported out from China. And, uh, and I have here again, the kidney transplant population in particular for those 46 patients in this cohort. And um, so going line by line, you know, high resolution or high sensitivity troponin in general was elevated in most patients, but did not statistically correlate with disease severity. Although you can see that the numbers were generally higher, 52 versus 18. Procalcitonin interestingly was also slightly higher in general. Um, and it did correlate with disease severity. Now, procalcitonin is an interesting inflammatory marker because it generally is correlated with bacterial infections and not viral infections. In fact, actually, that's the name, the, the major use for this marker in differentiating a bacterial pneumonia versus some non-bacterial process, at least for an infectious disease doctor like myself. So this was very puzzling why patients with severe disease had higher procalcitonin levels. At this initial stage, they did, were not found to have bacterial pneumonias. But again, procalcitonin could be an interesting marker for disease severity. C-reactive proteins were generally elevated as well at 63. And this is a, could be um, our own lab here. These are generally very sensitive assays, as you can see, um, and generally did numerically correlate with disease severity at 97 versus 58. Our kidney transplant patients were generally at the lower spectrum of the of a CRP elevation. D-dimers as an additional lab, uh, again, correlated with disease severity, um, but were uniformly elevated. So was ferritin. And you, you know, the, the big cytokine that uh, we were all curious about was IL-6 levels, and we were able to measure them um, um, quite frequently in our population. So they were, again, uniformly elevated at 20. Generally, this is considered elevated, anything above eight. Um, and, uh, but, but paradoxically, we're lower in the severe disease group versus the We don't know necessarily what this means. Um, we did measure peak levels, but have not been able to analyze those yet. So I won't be discussing that. These are just initial levels. And our kidney transplant patients were generally with a little bit lower IL-6 levels than the general population. So what to make of this second set of data that I'm giving you, uh, I would just recap that initial hypoxia and tachypnea were associated with severe disease, so be careful about that. Hypothermia possibly associated, so also keep an eye on that. 
definitely low albumin is something to uh, measure and uh, I'll make some decisions about. And then procalcitonin was the only inflammatory marker that was statistically associated with severe disease, although every other marker was uniformly elevated in our transplant population. Um, now moving on to what do we do for these patients? And this is our therapeutic approach here. And as, as you probably would suspect, um, it changed over time as our initial guidance um, um, needed to be adapted several weeks into this cohort. Uh, given our experience of patients progressing to severe disease and requiring intubation, but in general, for those patients with mild disease, whether as outpatients or not requiring any form of oxygen in the hospital, we generally just provided them with supportive care. And this is again for the general population. Um, uh, uh, transplant patients, um, uh, we will talk a little bit more uh, uh, next, but, uh, but then for, for those patients with moderate to severe disease, we try to enroll them in clinical trials whenever possible. So those were remdesivir and cerilumab, another IL-6 receptor blocker that we were talking about in addition to tocilizumab. Initially, these were very limited in our ability to enroll these patients. So what most patients were treated with as you would suspect, would be off-label hydroxychloroquine and initially with concurrent azithromycin. So um, our initial experience largely was with those two drugs. Um, and given our negative experience with that combination, um, which the next set of data will, will underline this, you will see we, we quickly dropped azithromycin from our guidance given sort of its potential QT prolongation along with hydroxychloroquine, but largely because it seemed ineffective in preventing severe disease. And later in, in our course of, of, of managing these patients, we also dropped hydroxychloroquine, uh, which was removed at the end of April from our guidance. Um, by then, remdesivir became more available through a number of clinical trials, and we'll talk about the emergency use authorization here in the United States um, that came around April 29th, so right around that time. For those patients who we thought had a hyperinflammatory process we, and could not get cerilumab, we were giving off-label tocilizumab, um, which is an, uh, a more commonly given IL-6 receptor inhibitor, um, or bolosteroids, which was methoprednisolone, one milligram per kilogram per day for five days, followed by a taper. And for these patients, the criteria for what constituted a patient undergoing hyperinflammatory syndrome varied and um, was in, in large sense difficult to define, um, but certainly patients with rising inflammatory markers and the kinetics of those were very important. If you had a CRP of 63 one day and the following day was over 150, that, that certainly was telling you something about that particular patient. But that had to be coupled with worsening respiratory symptoms and, and rising oxygen requirements as well as, at least to the, term, to the length that you could determine, greater than seven days of symptoms. And again, that goes with sort of our idea that by then, the patient's pathophysiology might be more inflammatory than viral. Um, again, the immunosuppressive management, uh, Dr. Hussein addressed yesterday, uh, but essentially in one, in, in, in one sentence, we aim to reduce or hold mycophenolate or the anti-metabolites and hold steady, continue with the same dose of calcineur inhibitors and or steroids if those patients were on them. Um, but I hope that he was able to give you a greater discussion of that. So for our hospitalized patients, um, in terms of what we actually did for them, as you can see here, the vast majority of them did have their anti-metabolite held. Uh, very few had otherwise, are there any other changes in their immunosuppressive regimen? Um, and as far as any sort of antiviral therapy, again, the vast majority of these patients did get hydroxychloroquine and plus minus azithromycin, um, very few initially. And again, this cohort ended on April 3rd, so we were still in the upswing of the infection. Um, there were very few received remdesivir through a clinical trial or through the compassionate use that was available here in the United States. Um, and as far as immunomodulatory therapy, you know, this was the beginning of basically a number of patients getting bolus steroids, particularly methoprednisolone, 
as well as tocilizumab. And some patients did get IVIG as well. In fact, actually just one patient in this cohort, uh, um, thinking that um, that could also uh, uh, reduce this hyperinflammatory cascade. So, and as far as the outcomes, um, and I, again, I added the kidney transplant patients here for you to see, um, these were the highest levels of respiratory support required during their hospitalization. So as you can see here, about a quarter of the patients were, were on room air, which was pretty good. About a third of them require some form of nasal cannula supplementation. 12% um, required either a non rebreather breather mask or BiPAP or high flow nasal cannula. So they were sort of in the in that danger zone, uh, um, trying to avoid intubation. But unfortunately, about a third of our patients ultimately required intubation and transfer to the ICU. Um, kidney transplants fared about the same as our general organ transplant population, perhaps a little bit less of non rebreather and a little bit less of intubation, but not statistically significant or not necessarily materially very different than the general organ transplant population. Um, as far as ICU admissions, this mirrored the intubation patients. So 19 of them eventually, once they were intubated, they were transferred to the ICU, uh, which is about a third of the patients. So 22% of our patients uh, were transferred to the ICU. Um, about mortality, ultimate mortality was 15% overall for these hospitalized patients, 13% um, overall for the kidney transplant. And you can see here a staggering 45% of those patients who were admitted or intubated to uh, were admitted to an ICU or mechanically ventilated passed away during this follow-up period. So about 21 days or, or so. And so pretty high mortality if you got intubated. Um, about a third of those patients by the end of our follow-up period were discharged. So this, these were good numbers. Only one got readmitted and this was not a kidney transplant patient. This was a liver transplant patient. The other good news is that about over half of the kidney transplant patients were discharged within three weeks of their presentation. So, so pretty good numbers in general. So perhaps signaling that kidney transplants were a little bit on the milder spectrum in terms of outcomes. Um, um, but again, it's a small cohort. So um, other outcomes that uh, um, are important to mention, a number of these patients did have secondary infections, as you would expect. So the longer they stayed intubated or in an ICU or even in the medical wards, the longer they had the chance to develop secondary infections. So we saw a number of common secondary ventilator-associated pneumonias like with MRSA, ESBL E. coli, Klebsiella, even a few cases of a carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. Um, so these proved quite difficult to treat. Uh, we had a number of central line associated bloodstream infections with both MRSA, E. coli, and including a few candidemia. Um, so so um, important uh, um, pathogen to pay attention to here. Uh, we had a number of patients with CMV reactivation, so this is also important. We were very curious what would happen to these patients, and these were late reactivations, not in the first two weeks or three weeks, but rather four weeks into the, their hospitalization, and perhaps correlated with tocilizumab and or steroids um, for treatment for their hyperinflammatory symptoms. We had one patient with uh, pulmonary aspergillosis as well. Had a number of patients with DDTs um, and some suspected pulmonary emboli but due to limitations in terms of uh, um, CAT scan, um, some patients did not have the ability to go down for a full diagnosis of pulmonary embolus. We had a few patients with strokes. In fact, actually one with a subarachnoid hemorrhage that was catastrophic um, in our transplant cohort. A number of patients with new dialysis requirements, um, including some kidney transplants who had been doing well and, and unfortunately had to go on dialysis. Um, we were not necessarily, we were not able to assess for rejection, at least biopsy proven rejection. Um, part of the measures to contain transmission in the hospital, as you would expect, was to limit patients going down for CAT scans, but also obtaining biopsies. So, so our patients really did not get a lot of biopsies. So whether those kidney transplants were rejecting or they just have organ failure due to their uh, um, overwhelming sepsis is, is not clear. So a few final observations in the outcomes. Um, our transplant population did experience high levels of morbidity and mortality. So in our whole cohort, there was 11%. This included outpatients as well. Among those who were hospitalized was 
And uh, when you counted uh, um, some additional patients, 37% of those patients uh, um, in the ICU did die. We had a few patients who were severely sick, um, but ultimately decided not to be intubated and cho chose hospice care instead. So uh, they were included in the overall severe mortality. That's why that was 45%. And this is 37%. Those are the patients who actually chose to go to the ICU and be intubated. Again, this is all uncertain because we don't know ultimately how many patients had COVID-19 during this cohort at that time in New York City. And this would certainly impact the whole cohort. Um, there were a significant number of secondary complications, as I just listed. Um, and ultimately, as the numbers suggest, you know, what was the efficacy of these early antivirals, in particular with hydroxychloroquine? You know, we deployed like many centers in the world in the absence of any robust data. Um, you know, if you were to do a literature review at that time, all we had was one uncontrolled trial from France that uh, um, strongly advocated for hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, later with some different data being presented from other centers. Remdesivir, unfortunately, and I will, we'll be talking about these a little bit more, was largely unavailable initially to us as it was for the, for the rest of the world, unfortunately. And then the uncertain timing and criteria for these anti-inflammatories like tocilizumab and steroids. All, a lot of this remains to be further defined um, and uh, we'll be looking for further data in the future to help us guide when to use these therapies. So I just wanted to take the last few minutes to talk about some initial data on the therapies because as you, as you would expect, you know, what do we do with this? you know, with, in particular with our transplant patients. So just a brief review of, of what we, we have seen in the literature that's noteworthy, uh, um, that will guide any sort of protocol and guidance that you may have at your own centers. Um, hydroxychloroquine, as you've probably been following the news, is now largely disfavored. And a lot of it came from this paper, also from a different group in France, at some point in mid-April, that basically when they compared in, among their hospitalized patients, those who receive hydroxychloroquine and did a propensity match to those who did not receive hydroxychloroquine and looked at a number of comorbidities and match for those, you can see that the death of transfer to the ICU remained largely unchanged at 19 versus 21%. And when you had a weighted proportion, this was essentially unchanged. Day seven mortality may be a slight signal in the hydroxychloroquine group, but when you look at it statistically, there was no difference. And then um, of acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, again, no change. In fact, actually, the hydroxychloroquine group had higher rates of ARDS versus the one without hydroxychloroquine. This is very brief. There were a number of additional studies that basically cast a long shadow on hydroxychloroquine as your main therapy uh, uh, for antiviral management for these patients. So what that left us is largely with remdesivir. Um, and this is really what most of us have been geared towards and, and are trying to treat uh, our patients with, and particularly early on in the disease. So the first report came in the England Journal of Medicine and also in mid-April, this was a compassionate use um, 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 study of remdesivir um, that uh, uh, essentially there were 53 patients all over the world that received this and there was no control. And essentially about two thirds of these patients improved after a meeting of 18 days. 57% um, of these patients eventually were extubated and almost half of them were discharged and the mortality rate of 13%. Again, this is an uncontrolled group. So we don't know these patients were generally sicker and with more severe disease, which is why the providers sought to treat them with compassionate use when that's severe. Um, so the mortality is high at 13%, but overall uh, uh, it was shown to be a pretty safe drug. Now this graph or this figure, I should say, um, I put it here because this is something that you'll be seeing in a lot of the studies. And this essentially is a demonstration of the ordinal scale that a number of studies have been using. And they basically have the sort of the different stages in terms of the clinical status for the patient. And they range from being discharged or only requiring ambient air, low flow oxygen, non-invasive measures like non-rebreather or um, high flow, invasive like mechanical ventilation or death. So you can see sort of the differing worsening levels. And this is when they, the patients were at a baseline at the time that they started remdesivir. And in general, anything uh, among the blue line is an improvement. 
this baseline is essentially no change, and the gray area is worsening of disease after exposure to remdesivir. So by and large, most patients did experience an improvement with remdesivir. What this study doesn't tell you is whether this was due to remdesivir or to just time, um, given that most patients do end up getting better anyways. Um, but anyways, this was sort of a, a, at least a positive sign that remdesivir uh, uh, seemed to have some effect, at least we hope so. And then came late April with a number of studies all being released in one day. Um, if you remember, there was a leak from the WHO, um, or not necessarily a leak, but an abstract that was uh, uh, um, on the website that talked about a study in China that showed no difference in uh, clinical benefits to remdesivir. Um, so this study was quite unique because it was done in China uh, around February and March on the waning days of their outbreak in Wuhan, China. So uh, it had to actually be terminated early because they couldn't enroll in more patients. But by and large, it was remdesivir versus placebo. Uh, in patients who were hospitalized uh, with severe COVID-19. And essentially, they found no statistical significant clinical benefits to remdesivir. So day 28 mortality, for example, was 14 versus 13% so difference. And it made no difference, actually, um, whether the patient were exposed to early versus late in their clinical course to remdesivir. Although perhaps a, somewhat of a signal here, 15% mortality versus 11% mortality in this cohort perhaps suggesting that earlier therapy is better than late therapy. Um, few patients, however, were on mechanical ventilation um, and about 60% of them did receive corticosteroids. Uh, but one thing that is important to note is that of those who were mechanically ventilated, uh, the ones who were exposed to remdesivir had a much shorter uh, duration of ventilation than those who were not. So. Although there was perhaps no, not an impact on mortality, these patients were being extubated at an earlier event than those who were not. So perhaps, again, another uh, positive sign from remdesivir, even though the overall conclusion to the study was that there was no difference. That same day, Gilead, wh who is the, the pharmaceutical company that was making um, remdesivir and sponsoring all these studies, had a top-line release of their um, a, a phase three study um, in, the, in the United States and actually multinational study. So this was actually a randomized open label multi-center study of those with severe COVID-19 and actually was up to almost 400 patients. And although there was no placebo, it was comparing a 10-day remdesivir regimen versus five days. And their primary clinical endpoint was at day 14, any clinical improvement on two or more points. And this was, again, that ordinal scale, whether they were intubated or on an armor breather, a nasal cannula, ambient air, discharge, or dead. Um, so this is what they were looking for, as well as they were looking at uh, a secondarily clinical recovery of those no longer requiring any form of oxygen support or at home or being discharged from the hospital. So if you look, um, in terms of outcomes between the five-day regimen versus 10-day regimen, um, there was uh, um, most, more than half of the patients did improve. Um, interestingly, the five-day regimen seemed to be better than the 10-day regimen. This is probably not statistically significant or, or something interpretable. Most patients did have clinical recovery. The vast majority of them did have, were discharged. And, uh, you know, some mortality, I suppose, 11% versus 8%. And again, you can't really compare these because, again, there was no placebo. Additional analyses uh, were interesting because those who were treated when they had less than 10 days of symptoms in general fared a little bit better in terms of being discharged versus those who started remdesivir after 10 days, um, 62 versus 49%. So whether this is clinically significant or not is not clear, but certainly a signal there that perhaps earlier antiviral therapy is better than uh, uh, late antiviral therapy. And I, once again, this was generally well tolerated. We don't have a lot of details from the study. This is as far as all that we, has been released to us at this point, and this was, was on their website as of April 29th. That same day, um, an additional uh, data set from the NIH study, um, the ACT-1 uh, uh, adaptive study, showed similar results um, than that from the Gilead study in that um, uh, patients on remdesivir had a little bit of better outcome. And that study actually had a placebo arm and the mortality was 15% down to 11% for those patients. And as you probably remember from Anthony Fauci, 
the preliminary results showed clear-cut significant positive effect from remdesivir, but certainly not a knockout in the, in the sense of, you know, the, the mortality benefit was dramatic. But based on those early results, the FDA and the NIH and the government in the U.S. did release this uh, emergency use authorization on May 1st for patients with severe disease um, that basically Gilead, uh, through the government, distributed remdesivir to a number of academic centers or, or medical centers in the United States for a direct use of remdesivir. This is outside of a clinical trial where the physicians could simply just prescribe remdesivir for their patient, provided that they met a number of criteria like laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, some degree of hypoxia for sure, they were inpatients and were willing to receive this. Um, some, some risk versus benefits discussion in those who were pregnant and as well as those with the creatinine clearance less than 30, as well as hepatic impairment. Um, again, you know, and five versus 10 days were optional, uh, were, were to be discussed with the provider. So that's where we have, we have our antivirus. When it comes to anti-inflammatories, certainly there's been uh, also a lot of discussion about the role of corticosteroids and this, and I have to say here at Columbia, it has become a mainstay of our therapy for immunomodulation. Um, we know that there is this initial WHO statement not recommending the routine use of corticosteroids for the treatment of viral pneumonia outside of the clinical trials, um, particularly given the concern that this would increase uh, 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 viral shedding and viral replication. Um, but we did know that there was some mortality benefit in early ARDS from the sort of non-SARS-CoV-2 literature. But certainly from COVID-19, there was this sort of this initial limited data from two studies in China one a little slightly bigger than the other one with 201 patients with severe COVID-19, where there was a mortality benefit in a subset of patients with ARDS, 46% versus 61%. Now, obviously these are staggering numbers, but as you can see here, the ones with methoprednisolone did have higher survival rates than those without methoprednisolone. Again, the numbers are not great, but certainly was a signal. And for those who were experiencing like we were in late April, really dramatic deterioration in our patients, despite having hydroxychloroquine, uh, we were looking for any solution. So at our center, we did adopt methoprednisolone at some point in, in late April or mid-April. And uh, this was our protocol at either one milligram per kilogram per day, or at least 0.5 milligrams per kilogram divided in, in two doses for the day for five to seven days, followed by a one to two day taper. And but this was provided that the patient met certain criteria, in particular, symptoms for greater than seven days, clear indication or assessment that they were progressing in their respiratory deterioration, and certainly something greater than six liters of oxygen on the nasal cannula. Um, and and uh, although we didn't use uh, inflammatory markers here, certainly there was sort of a, a, an idea that these patients had elevated inflammatory markers. And ideally, they had received some form of antiviral agents, um, you know, again, whether hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir, where we're just happy with anything of direct antiviral activity. Um, and although we don't, we don't necessarily have a lot of data on that, our anecdotal experience is that we were able to prevent a number of intubations on early uh, um, uh, initiation of methoprednisolone. That data will be forthcoming uh, um, with, with, with later publications. And as far as tocilizumab, uh, we certainly have used it here uh, on a number of patients. And again, we're still analyzing our data, um, but we, we certainly wanted evidence of cytokine release syndrome for those patients, uh, in particular, those who lacked any kind of response to corticosteroids. So we sort of had a two-stage uh, intervention, first corticosteroids, and if they were not improving on that, then give them tocilizumab. Um, and we certainly considered on a case-by-case basis in conjunction with our infectious disease group. We obviously wanted them to be evaluated for cerilumab first, and we're, we're strongly, uh, I want to support trials as opposed to off-label use of these drugs. Uh, but we were certainly concerned about concurrent infections and or encephalopathy with tocilizumab. Um, and the only data so far that has been published, although this is also pre-proof, came from a group from Milan, um, or in particular Brescia, Italy, in the northern Italy, where they uh, reported on 100 consecutive patients with ARDS that require or required intubation. 43 of them were already intubated, 
and 57 of them were on some form of non-invasive ventilation awaiting intubation. Um, and 10 days later, after administration of tocilizumab, 77% of them experienced some form of respiratory improvement or stabilization, meaning that they, they either were already extubated or they are FiO2 or their oxygen requirement did not sort of deteriorate. 23% of them did worsen after tocilizumab, including 20% of them who passed away um, at 10 days. And this is just, again, another representation of this organ scale. Um, they had their own acronym for it, but essentially these, this was discharge, ambient air, nasal cannula, non-breather, high flow, intubated, ECMO, um, and, and then deaths or poor outcomes. So, um, and you can see sort of before tocilizumab, 24 to 72 hours after tocilizumab, and then 10 days after for those patients in the ICU, you can see an overall improvement in their scale as well for the patients who are not in the ICU just yet, but were awaiting transfer to the ICU, none of them were intubated because they couldn't be intubated. But after 10 days, there was this improvement. So the timing of tocilizumab, it turns out that it's incredibly important that you do want to, if you think your patient has this hyperinflammatory syndrome, you do want to act early before intubation uh, um, with the thinking is that's where you may have the greatest impact in their um, hyperinflammatory lung pathophysiology. Cerilumab, um, as you know, is another IL-2, IL-6 receptor blocker. This is from a company called Regeneron, um, and they've had a phase two, phase three randomized control trial for those patients with severe or critical COVID-19. Um, they've had three arms. It was a single dose on day one that could be redosed at 24 hours later, uh, mostly for adults hospitalized patients with COVID-19 within 14 days. And with, like many of these studies from the severe study, major exclusion criteria, like an absolute neutral fuel count less than 2,000, an ASC ALT greater than five times the upper limit of normal, some degree of thrombocytopenia, um, um, but also patients who were suspected or known to have active bacterial or fungal infections. Um, but generally, we have been able to enroll a number of these patients. And in fact, actually, Regeneron, also in late April, did show that um, um, there, there was a severe and a critical group. And the critical group um, had a better response to cerilumab than the severe group. And based on that, um, there's been a change in that protocol um, in that they're going to do the higher dose cerilumab in patients who are critically ill, meaning those who are either recently intubated or about to be intubated. So um, um, a number, so, so there is a signal that IL-6 receptor blockers are of potential benefit here in our population. So just to sort of finish here, you know, um, I know I covered a lot. Um, the world has seen a lot in the last six to eight weeks, um, if not longer. Um, and I think the understanding is that you know, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 will remain a problem for months and years to come. Um, we don't have a magic bullet yet, um, but, but, you know, and, and the world will go through different stages of outbreaks. Um, the therapies still remain uncertain, although we are coalescing around uh, remdesivir, at least early antiviral therapy, and uh, immunomodulatory therapy after day seven, but hopefully before patients get into this. Um, Vaccine development, you know, I had this here, vaccine development will be slow, although many of you have heard the news today that a company from Boston called Moderna has released some early reports that their messenger RNA vaccine seems to be very safe, but potentially effective in creating neutralizing antibodies uh, in the uh, few patients um, in this phase one, phase two study that they, uh, they just released some data. Um, and, and what's really exciting about this release of information today is that the antibodies that were produced by this vaccine seem to mimic um, uh, uh, the, the type of antibodies formed by those patients who have recovered from COVID-19. So they're hoping that these, in fact, are neutralizing. And in vitro, they are seem to be neutralizing. Um, and that it was a dose response. So those with the higher dose of the vaccine um, generated more antibodies versus those with the lower dose. So all seem to, to, to match uh, uh, quite nicely here in how we would want the vaccine to respond. 
Um, but until that is widely disseminated, you know, uh, our focus ought to be on prevention, early detection of COVID-19, and, and effective therapies, uh, both antiviral and immunomodulatory um, for all of our patients. And, uh, and with that, I think that's the end of my slides. I'll be happy to take your questions. Hazen? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. That was uh, very uh, enlightening and uh, 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 thorough uh, talk. I will open the uh, podium for a question. Uh, I'll start with you know, one question from the audience. Do you know the incidence or the point of prevalence of uh, COVID infection among the total transplant uh, population you're caring for? Good, that's a great question. We, we really want to know that answer. We do not know yet. Um, and uh, the problem is that again, PCR testing has been very limited uh, up until a few weeks ago. Um, what we're turning to is serological testing. Um, so antibody tests. And what we're hoping that in the upcoming weeks to months, testing all of our pre-transplant and post-transplant population so that we have a better idea. But assuming that some of this, you know, it's obviously an assumption here that is likely to be proven wrong, but um, the general population here in New York, um, so far the numbers are about between five and 10% of the population has been infected. Um, so we're thinking that our transplant patients are about the same number. And the uh, second question is on the pathogenesis. And, you know, this has been uh, questioned again and again. Uh, we know that mortality uh, with uh, people with comorbidity uh, are higher, but there's still some buzzling, you know, connect some, you know, medical staff uh, healthy in their 20s, you know, uh, died. Uh, and yeah. some elder, you know, uh, made it through and uh, uh, got it cured. Uh, any, uh, you know, further insight other than, you know, being uh, just comorbidities or is it genetic or viral inoculum or your your Yeah, comorbid? yeah. So that's an excellent question. And the viral inoculum, it seems to be pretty important. Um, you know. In, this goes back to knowing a number of staff who have been infected. And we think that healthcare workers are probably getting a higher inoculum of, of infection than the community. Um, so we, we certainly have seen a number of poor outcomes um, among our colleagues, unfortunately. And uh, so there is some thought that the higher the inoculum, the harder it is for the, those initial immune responses, whether through antibody or complement fixation, or even that dysregulated T cell response uh, um, are going to be uh, um, either initially deficient and later uh, uh, dysregulated. So there potentially could be a correlation there between the viral inoculum and disease outcomes. It's very hard to, to measure those. Um, you know, the nasopharyngeal swab PCRs don't give you a number. That's purely a qualitative answer. Um, you know, we have played around with the cycle threshold counts in the PCR. Um, but again, that those are that's difficult to assess um, because it's not validated to do that. Um, but but certainly we're worried about that. Uh, excellent. And in form of diagnostic with the PCR, uh, and particularly more toward you know monitoring after uh, admission, uh, mm -hmm. do you really mandate a, a negative uh, PCR before discharge? And uh, what is your thought on? you know, difference between intact virus versus just positive PCR? Yeah, that's another great question. So um, we certainly have been monitoring uh, uh, subsequent viral PCRs on our patients. Um, now, uh, a number of issues are related to that. So um, we've seen a, a prolonged duration in which patients remain positive. Um, you know, up to three weeks, four weeks, even in the general population, in some transplant patients up to six weeks with positive nasopharyngeal PCRs. And sometimes you have a negative PCR followed by a positive PCR, which is quite puzzling to us 
Um, and largely what we've determined is, you know, it could be operator dependent, right? Someone who uh, performed a nasopharyngeal swab one way and the other person the next day performed a different day, you might get different results. Um, we did not mandate a negative PCR for patients to be discharged. And, 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 um, and you can imagine that we really wanted patients who were well and we felt were capable of going home, they were better off being at home uh, than in a hospital where other sort of secondary complications could occur. But part of the discharge plan certainly required a good plan for them to care for themselves, whether you know there was family that could care for them or they were able to care for themselves. They had a safe place that they were not going to put those at risk, their family members or their friends. Um, in particular for those with a positive PCR. So logistically, it has been difficult uh, um, to, to ultimately discharge some patients. Um, nursing homes were rarely taking patients, just be, again, for the same concerns of them uh, protecting the other residents of nursing homes. Um, so, so a lot of logistical issues with that. Um, but the, uh, the follow-up PCR is certainly has been puzzling. Now, what does it mean six weeks afterwards for you to have a positive nasopharyngeal swab? Um, we're still determining, you know, are you truly infectious uh, six weeks after, especially with clinical improvement, or are these remnants of the RNA that you just happen to pick up? Um, now, we know that with DNA testing, that can be true, that you just have fragments of DNA and you don't have any kind of viable pathogen. But with RNA, that's a little bit more of a difficult argument because RNA is generally less stable than DNA. Um, so if six weeks out, six weeks out, someone has a positive RNA PCR, um, it may well mean that they have viable particles. Um, and and but whether they are infectious or not, that's more difficult to determine. Uh, we are looking at that in particular for our pre-transplant and our post-transplant population because we do think that they probably will have more prolonged viral shedding and uh, could be more infectious for longer. Uh, second question is, uh, you know, on the clinical manifestation and uh, particularly for patient presenting with uh, diarrhea, uh, did you find uh, an increased risk of acute kidney injury in these, uh, you know, particular subset of patients and in form of therapy for that, any special therapy other than supportive care? Great question. So we, we did find some patients presenting with severe dehydration in the general population, uh, which luckily was more readily corrected um, for those patients. The you probably have seen some in the literature that you know diarrhea as a presentation for COVID-19 may be associated with milder outcomes. Um, again, because that's something that you can more easily correct with IV fluids and uh, parenteral nutrition. Um, what we have seen, however, is that not everybody necessarily recovers rapidly. Some patients may simply just have a more delayed um, uh, evolution to respiratory symptoms, whereas, for example, the inoculum was gastrointestinal initial, uh, but those patients probably experienced some form of internal spread to their respiratory tissue and then later developed respiratory symptoms. And in fact, actually, we've seen some deaths in those patients as well, but more prolonged. So they, they, they generally develop that progression much later on. Uh, a question on, uh, you know, patients who are uh, either co-infected with other viruses like CMV or BK virus. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is two part. One, do you think they are at more risk of uh, the COVID infection because, you know, they are more immunosuppressed and hence demonstrated by other viral infection? And in, in form of therapy, anything different did you do for these subset of patients? So we didn't find that CMV itself is a risk factor for COVID-19 um, or that antiviral therapy placed them at greater risk. We did find that, you know, for some of those nosocomially spread patients, they were in the hospital receiving therapy for rejection. Um, so whether they just had 
you know, whether it was because the inoculum in the hospital was a higher or whether they, they, it was due to their more severe immunosuppression, those patients did have poor outcomes. One of them has been intubated for several weeks and another one passed away. Um, so, uh, but, so, so immunosuppression itself, intense immunosuppression seems to be a poor prognostic factor. Now, CMV, what we have seen is more a secondary complication from COVID-19. Um, and whether it's from the infection itself, given high levels of CNF-alpha or, or high inflammatory levels that then subsequently reactivate CMV, or because of the steroids and tocilizumab, that remains to be teased out. Um, but, uh, but certainly tocilizumab has been reported as a, an agent that can cause CMV reactivation. So um, we, 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 we have recommended all of our transplant patients who receive tocilizumab to be monitored for CMV and perhaps even go on prophylaxis. Uh, and this would take us probably to the second question is, uh, uh, would you give anti, you know, bacterial, fungal, viral prophylaxis, especially in those who receive the steroid or tocilizumab? As we have seen, you know, in the fourth week, uh, 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 late complication, patient develop uh, candidemia and other bacterial uh, uh, infection? Yeah, um, so we're, we're defining the protocol right now, but uh, I, I certainly think that there is a, 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 we will be advocating for CMV prophylaxis for those who receive tocilizumab, um, provided that they, it's safe in the, in the sense of uh, 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 bone marrow suppression. Um, so we will go with valgan cyclovir for those patients. Um, as far as bacterial and fungal prophylaxis, we have not coalesced around that idea just yet. Um, and namely because we're worried about multidrug resistant infections as well as C. difficile. We haven't seen a lot of C. difficile, but we're worried that we will be seeing probably in the subsequent weeks downstream effects from all the antibiotics that some of these patients are receiving. Uh, in form of uh, you know, therapy, I think we were in an intense need to treat, and that's probably, uh, we kept the threshold very low to use anything. And uh, that's what mm -hmm. we did for hydroxychloroquine. Uh, you know, uh, several questions are coming. Are we doing the same, you know, with remdesivir or other? At least there is no randomized controlled trial, you know, compared to placebo that show that it is positive. And, you know, whether from the compassionate use or the other two studies, even if it is, you know, positive, if you look at it and from positive side, it's not really the treatment uh, that would cure right. the disease. What is your comment? Yeah, I, it certainly has crossed our minds that are, are, we, are we making the same mistake again of jumping to some therapy that we are more hopeful than we should be um, about it. Um, and, and I share uh, uh, that concern that the data continue to be very thin on the, effect, on the effectiveness of remdesivir. Um, it seems that it's, it's, it's overall a safe drug um, at this point. Um, you know, very few side effects, although, you know, it's, Sort of, we are worried about some development of hepatitis in particular, but everybody, everything else seems to be okay uh, with remdesivir. And, uh, and as you can see, the only data that we have that's somewhat more robust is with the severe patients. Um, so those requiring higher levels of oxygenation, um, that uh, um, it seems that at least according to the NIH and the Gilead, that's what we have in terms of the data so far that it, shows a perhaps, a perhaps a mortality benefit and, and, and better clinical benefit. So that's who we're going with. We're in the same situation that we, we, we are concerned about treating patients with mild to moderate disease so far with an experimental drug. So we are not doing that right now. But the great conundrum is that those are probably the patients who, if this was an antiviral that is effective, who might benefit the most. Um, but I guess, but, in, but it's important for us all to, to abide by first do no harm um, uh, before we jump into that drug for that population. Um, we are all eagerly awaiting uh, um, more data on remdesivir. And in some ways, the saving grace for remdesivir is that we don't have a lot of remdesivir to give out. Um, the way we had with hydroxychloroquine that we literally put hundreds, if not a, a few thousand patients here at Columbia Presbyterian on hydroxychloroquine. Um, so we, our, our 
our potential harm will be limited. Let's put it that way. Uh, we're hoping thank not. You, we're hoping it's actually quite effective, <laughs> but you know, we all have to be yeah, very, we hope so. very and thoughtful about our intervention. Uh, and what is your comment on using uh, either IVIG or you know plasma from convalescent uh, patient uh, for either early uh, you know moderate disease or late in the disease process? Yeah, I didn't mention so much about that because the data are are much less defined. We do have here a convalescent plasma study um, that is enrolling patients. So the idea of convalescent plasma are, are sort of the ability to give neutralizing antibodies from someone who has recovered um, to someone who is sick with COVID-19. Um, it is in some ways different than IVIG. You know, we, we, we don't think that there's necessarily a bigger role for IVIG um, in patients without SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. Um, you know, IVIG has a number of roles for treatment of rejection and immunomodulatory factors, but we're not sure that it really has a role for any stages of COVID-19 itself. Um, but convalescent plasma, we, it's at least thought to be safe in general. Uh, and you know, we, we've enrolled a few dozen patients so far, generally has been a good experience. But, um, but again, the data are lacking in terms of how effective it can be. And it depends on how you think, how, what is its mechanism of action? Is this an antiviral drug or an anti-inflammatory drug? Uh, we tend to think it's more an antiviral drug. Um, so, so we've been advocating for early use um, versus later use. Can Hello? you describe uh, particularly the trans? Yeah, I, I can hear, we can hear you well, okay. uh, Dr. Pereira. In form of staff safety, particularly the transplant team, uh, uh, can you describe your experience in, in New York? Like how many, how many of the staff got infected, uh, nursing, physician, surgeon, coordinator? How many of them are infected? Infected. So we 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 have not kept numbers, um, you know, and a, and a number of staff probably didn't report back to us. But you know, in in mid March, late March, and early April, um, right in the middle of all that surge. And I do have to say, you know, when when recommendations were for us not to wear masks, um, and uh, uh, you know, to to sort of limit protective here, um, we've, as far as our transplant staff here, there were a handful of infections. I would say about probably 10 or so out of a staff of a few hundred. Um, you know, and that's as far as what we know. Um, you know, it would be very interesting. We're right now doing a serology study among all the healthcare workers here at Columbia Presbyterian. Um, we don't have any data yet, but um, it would be extremely interesting to know what percent of our of our staff overall has been infected with COVID-19? Obviously, we've seen some dramatic um, 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 stories about young nurses and, and and even physicians who have passed away, probably from that inoculum effect um, rather than anything else. Uh, excellent. You know, uh, uh, on the same line, a uh, question of particularly from nursing asking. Uh, would you uh, like do random uh, uh, PCR testing or mandate any testing and uh, the staff uh, coming back to practice? Well, for the staff, um, so those recommendations changed um, uh, every few weeks or so, and it was largely dependent on the availability of PCR testing. So in the beginning, we, we, we were reserving the few PCRs that we had um, for patients so that we could diagnose them and, and uh, prevent hospital spread. Um, but at this point, um, since PCR is, the issue has been resolved and we have largely availability of those tests. Uh, anyone who has any symptoms gets tested. 
um, or anyone who wants to be tested, who thinks they could be asymptomatic carriers gets tested. Um, but, uh, but there's no mandatory rule for um, all the staff being tested right now. Um, so we, we have not mandated that. Um, for inpatients, um, anyone coming in gets tested so that we can you know, triage them into the appropriate units. And for those who are negative, they get periodically tested in the hospital so that we can determine that they, they are uninfected still. And for those who are infected, like we mentioned before, they do get beginning in week two to three in their disease course, uh, they start getting PCR testing so that we know when they could clear so they could, they could leave the COVID unit. Uh, the last part of the question is uh, questions here are on the uh, restarting transplant. Uh, yeah. What is you know the metric do you, would you use to uh, suggest to restart programs, and whether in form of urgency for transplant or uh, you know low scale, high scale, or uh, uh, back to the new norm? Yeah, we're, it certainly will be some time before we're back to normal. Um, but uh, we, we have begun scaling up. Um, right now, the hospital is in a transition period from clearing out some of the OR rooms that were transitioned to ICUs back to normal operating rooms. Um, and uh, priority will be given to some of the transplant uh, um, sections of the, the, the uh, OR floor um, so that they can restart. Um, you know, we have a huge backlog of, of patients, um, both awaiting living donor transplants as well as deceased donor. Now, the, the, the living donors in some ways are much easier to start, as you can imagine. So those are all queued up at this point. And in the next week or two, once um, everything is sort of back in, in fashion, they, they will be reinitiated. Um, as far as deceased donor, you know, we've been working very closely with our organ procurement organization or OPO here in New York um, in terms of evaluating donors. So that, that aspect is a little bit, you know, it, it's complex right now. And I'm part of this, this discussion. How does one assess a deceased donor? Um, you know, so, so basically repeat PCR testing, the uh, clinical presentation, whether this could be um, uh, correlated with COVID-19 or not. Um, you know, if someone died of, you know, car, car accident, um, that's different than someone obviously presenting with a pneumonia um, and subsequently passed away um, or, or could be deceased donors. So, uh, but for living donors, they, they will require PCR testing in, in the week before schedule to make sure they're still negative. And then uh, um, in the day of, of transplant as well, both for the, for the donor and for the recipient um, to make sure that they're still asymptomatic and uninfected um, at the time of transplant. Um, so, and as, and as far as giving priorities, so certainly, you know, our lung transplant, our heart transplant team, as well as our liver transplant teams, and when it comes to sort of those fulminant liver failure patients, um, those have been actually, we have transplanted those in the last month. Um, they, they never were completely frozen. Um, you know, that discussion has always been the risk versus benefit, you know, and, and as someone um, critically ill, who only whose only life-saving intervention would be a transplant, and if there is a su suitable donor, um, the discussion was thorough. But uh, at the end of the day, the benefits of that procedure outweighed the risks of undergoing a procedure in the middle of a COVID-19 outbreak. So those did occur, and and luckily, with all the precautions of making sure that. The patient uh, was uninfected at the time. The donor was thoroughly evaluated. They went into a COVID-free special operating room uh, with a staff that was also monitored for not having symptoms that could, could transmit to those patients. And, um, and obviously, you know, there was buy-in from the hospital administration to allocate such resources to that particular transplant. Um, so, so all of it had to be in place for those to occur. And those did occur. We, we did several lung transplants, a couple heart transplants, and uh, a, a few liver transplants as well during that period. Kidney transplants a little bit different because you do have temporizing measures. So uh, uh, that was not prioritized during in the last month or six weeks. Uh, excellent. And in form of, for the pediatric patient, you know, most of the data you presented were on the adult 
Uh, do you have any yeah. data or comment on the pediatric? Uh, some of the pediatric colleagues are asking. Yeah, um, you know, interestingly, very few pediatric patients did present with COVID-19, you know, and, and it really mirrors the overall general population. We, we kept discussing this with our peds transplant ID colleagues and our, and our pediatric heart, liver, kidney uh, 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 programs, and very few patients were admitted. Um, and, uh, and the vast majority of them did well, at least from that initial stage. Now, what's happening now, and I'm sure you've seen in the news, is sort of this multi-inflammatory uh, process that's happening that's sort of somewhat similar to Kawasaki. I don't think that we have seen any PEDS transplant cases that yet, although they are bracing themselves for that. Um, so uh, I, I don't have any information on that, but, uh, but we, we expect it to impact some of the PEDS transplant patients as well. Excellent. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Berrera, Marcus, thank you very much. This is really very uh, insightful and uh, 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 interesting uh, discussion. You know, I have more than 50 other questions, but I'm sure we cannot uh, uh, carry it over. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, this uh, talk and for your time. And uh, I'll hand the mic to uh, my colleague, Dr. Khalid, Khalid Al-Hassan. Khalid, please. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Uh, um, so pe personally, as I am the president of the Saudi Society of Nephrology and in behalf of all our members uh, in, the, in the society, as in our colleagues, we'd like to thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pirara, for a wonderful talk. Um, and as Hassan, he mentioned, there is uh, lots of a question I'm seeing in the Q&A and &E, and uh, the people got interested to have uh, of this question. Thank you for all. Uh, the experience uh, that you have and you give it to us. And we hope that next time we'll have uh, another uh, uh, collaboration with you, inshallah. Uh, also, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Hassan, for excellent moderating of this uh, session. I will not forget to thank uh, our sponsors of this webinar, SPIMACO. Uh, without their support, uh, we cannot uh, do all the, those webinars. Uh, by this uh, webinar, um, we are concluded the webinars in Ramadan, and we'll have um, Ramadan break and Eid celebration break, inshallah. Uh, have, um, have a good time, inshallah. Stay safe. Uh, see you after Eid, inshallah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.